is Sharice Montgomery, and I will be talking with you about developing project ideas and effective driving questions. And hopefully we can clear up some of the um, lingering questions that some of you still have about these ideas. <coughs> um, I'll be focusing on four basic areas. The first is criteria that you can use to help you select and develop a meaningful project. The second is our resources or ideas for where you can find good um, project ideas. The third is a little bit of a discussion about why some project-based language learning breaks down. And the last piece we will, or during the last um, segment, we'll be addressing how you can craft powerful driving questions. Um, I think one of the things that, the, that is really important to think about is that what constitutes a good project-based um, language learning assignment or project depends on our ultimate goal. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about my perspectives, and then um, we can kind of go from there. Um, I think that all true learning actually ends up transforming the learner. Um, and so the idea is that if we really want students to become fluent and proficient language users, then we need to get them to integrate language into their own selves or into their identities, and along with it, the cultures in which those languages are spoken. Um, as I have reviewed the research literature about how one might uh, go about transforming student learning, um, there are several key concepts for me, and I think these are things that you can sort of keep in mind as you're thinking about um, looking for project ideas. The first is that um, the things that matter the most to us are things that move us. They are things that evoke emotion from us, they're emotionally engaging, and they are things that make us want to take action or to change the world. The things that transform us tend to be cognitively challenging and socially satisfying. So in other words, we need to be thinking about students' heads, their hearts, and their hands, and their own personal identities as we're crafting our projects. Now, there are lots of different types of projects, and this came up quite a bit in the um, chat. Uh, I think one of the great things about project-based language learning is that it is so wide open in terms of how you want to define a project, um, out, you know, uh, other than those uh, key considerations that we listed. So you might have students inquiring, which would involve some sort of experiment or cultural expl exploration. You might have students making things, so they're producing, whether that's books or public service announcements or uh, newscasts or things along those lines. You might have students serving the community. Maybe they're trying to solve a problem or learning through serving somebody else. And you can have students performing. So they might be involved in um, presenting something to the community or in a simulated sort of activity of some sort. Um, in each of these kinds of projects, there are some key pieces that we want to consider in order for them to be projects that we know are truly going to be transformative. The first one is that we want the project to be something that encourages students to explore their own beliefs, their own values, and their own identities. So what this is really saying is that we need to figure out projects that will connect students to the world in some way and help them to explore that connection or that relationship between them. The second characteristic is that ideally we want the project to extend beyond the classroom. We want to give students opportunities to communicate with other audiences and we want those audiences to be for real purposes, meaningful purposes. The third thing is that we want um, students to have opportunities to explore real world context. So not just their own beliefs and identities, but their own beliefs and identities within the context of something that they care about. In uh, university settings, that might relate to students' career goals, for example. In other settings, it might relate to um, current events or other kinds of things. We kind of already talked about the idea of connecting students with authentic audiences for authentic purposes within those real world contexts. And I'm going to give you some examples of this in a little bit. In other words, successful project-based language learning incorporates 21st century skills. 
This is a list of 21st century skills based on the actual 21st century skills map created by Lauren Rosen. Um, and one of the things that I think is useful as we look at this list is that if you look at the top four things, those are all things that actually are essential to any kind of learning. Um, because learning happens through thinking, right? And so the more opportunities students have to communicate about what they're learning, to collaborate with, what, with others uh, and process the things that they're learning, and then to do something with that learning, the more likely we know from the research literature it is that that learning will transfer into their daily lives. In order to do those things, students need a certain set of skills. And many of those skills revolve around information and media and technology literacy. Um, and so literacy, which is a great thing for language teachers because we're very focused on building literacy in lots of different ways, um, needs to be a key piece of what we're doing. And as students have opportunities to do those things, um, particularly in a project-based language learning setting, they also have opportunities to develop the last five skill sets that are listed there. Uh, and we'll talk more specifically about how a teacher might develop these things through projects in just a minute. But um, the main point that I want to make regarding the 21st century skills is that the more of these that you purposefully incorporate into your project, the more powerful and impactful the project is likely to be for your students. So where can you find meaningful project ideas? Um, <clears throat> first of all, you need to notice problems and possibilities. So a lot of um, some of the most powerful changes that have been made in the world have simply occurred because somebody noticed an issue that other people weren't thinking about, or somebody saw an opportunity in something that seemed mundane. And so that would be the first uh, key is to notice. The second thing would be to reflect. So think about what it is that you would love to change about the world that you live in. And when I say world, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be the whole global world. It might be just your own personal working conditions or um, students' personal environments. So getting yourself and your students to think about what is it that you'd like to change how can you change it? How can you make the world a better place? And who are the people or resources that could help you to affect that change? Is a really great starting place for thinking about a project idea. Um, I love interacting with my students and involving my students. And quite often I will talk with my students to, to get ideas for projects. So um, for example, you might find out what it is that students are upset about or interested in or have concerns about. Um, in my school, a lot of things had to do with school policy, things like um, the uniform, you know, school uniforms or things of that nature. And those can be the impetus for interesting projects. Some of my students were concerned about literacy and had heard about um, people in other countries who didn't have access to um, even the, the most basic kinds of school supplies. And so they decided to do something about that. Um, notice in the center of this slide that it starts with you. Um, you have to think about what matters to you and what drives your interests and, and what unique talents and capacities you have that might lend themselves naturally to some kind of a project. And then as you consult with students and get them thinking about their school, their, their local community, or the nation, or the world, um, you can end up with some pretty powerful things. And so sometimes the project starts small and might expand um, as you progress. Um, a lot of people might be afraid to consult students. Um, I will eventually post this list uh, with the other modules, but I think it's really important for us to really be aware that very young students are doing very powerful things that are changing the world. You may have read about the seventh grader who built the Braille printer from Legos in the news recently. Um, and these are a list of lots of other kinds of things that students are doing. Um, if you look here, uh, teenagers, high schoolers, are inventing cancer tests, creating bioplastics, um, bringing schools to other countries, um, building things to detect brain cancer. <clears throat> Kids are really capable of doing amazing things if we would give them the time and the opportunity to do it. And many of these kids on this list are doing these things outside of a school context. 
Um, but I think it could be very interesting for us to start asking them what their interests are. Um, there are lots of resources for doing that, and I will post a list of some of these online as well for you. Um, the next step is to consider your community. What are some things that are happening in your community? So here's an example of a project that a French teacher is doing. And you'll notice that the concern is that enrollment in French classes has decreased for this teacher um, in competition actually with another language. And so the teacher is involving students to think about this issue. What are some action plan actions that we could take to increase French enrollment? And how could we present this plan to other people? <coughs> this teacher set up a website for students um, to kind of guide them through the process. And I have posted this link in Lesson 3 as well um, so that you can explore it at your leisure. But you'll notice that the teacher has some very clear essential questions that that they want the, teach the students to think about in preparation for the driving questions that are going to guide um, the, the way the project functions. An additional context you might want to consider are social problems, things that are happening in the news um, and in the environment. And one really great connection for that are the AP Global themes. Now, just because your students are in level one doesn't mean that you can't be thinking about some of these global issues and themes. Um, and then more specifically, uh, individual contexts or particular contexts within these bigger global themes. So I want to give you a couple of ideas of how teachers have done this. Um, this particular teacher is a teacher of Arabic, and you're notice, you'll notice that um, they're concerned about, you know, in terms of the 21st century and having a global perspective, we have to be mindful of many different cultures. And um, this particular person feels that, that in North America, people don't really understand Arab cultures. And so this project is set up as kind of a simulation where students are going to take different perspectives and explore the roles of these different um, uh, explore culture through the eyes of a person or from the perspective of each of these different people and then they're going to develop some kind of multimedia project to share that. Connecting to cultural context can be a powerful place for project ideas. For example, um, in my, when I was uh, working in Michigan, there was a local doctor who had uh, participated in some it was kind of a Doctors Without Borders type project. And when she came back from the project, she gave a talk in which she explained that a lot of people would, who didn't have shoes, who didn't have access to health care except when the volunteers came during the, the season that wasn't rainy when they could open the volunteer clinic, were having to have horrible procedures performed like amputations because they had gotten a scratch, but they didn't have the literacy or the health information to know how to treat that scratch um, to the point where it got infected and then the limbs had to be amputated. So she worked with some of my students who were beginning Spanish students studying body parts and healthcare. Um, so these students were uh, in a position where they started putting together materials. They researched what are some of the common illnesses and problems in that region of the world, um, and they used their uh, language skills to put together um, basically public service announcement type materials and materials to, to teach literacy skills to these, um, to people in this particular situation. This is an example of a project where a student was concerned about um, sea turtles and the fact that lots of sea turtles are dying as a result of human pollution and things of that nature. And so this student created an activity booklet that teachers could use in the schools um, in order to address this. So why does some project-based language learning break down? There are lots of reasons. The first one is that a lot of times we find projects, but we forget about the language learning piece. And so it's important that we keep language proficiency, and more specifically, the development of students' language proficiency central as we are working on it. Project-based language learning requires rich fuel. Um, so a lot of times teachers think exclusively in terms of grammar and vocab. 
but students cannot develop strong proficiency in any language without also having strong content knowledge, strong knowledge of culture, good critical thinking skills, and opportunities to communicate. We've already talked a little bit about the world readiness standards, um, but I want to talk about where projects break down in terms of these standards. So you might find a great project idea, but if the project doesn't naturally generate a need to communicate, um, then maybe, it's, maybe we need to tweak the project. So a lot of teachers are already doing projects in their classrooms, and you can apply the standards as a way of evaluating those projects. Um, one of the other issues with project-based learning is that a lot of projects tend to focus on the presentational mode. And so we want to make sure that students are having opportunities to communicate in all three modes. Does the project require collaboration or inquiry where they're having to interview someone or do something with their language interpersonally in preparation for that presentational event? Uh, in terms of culture, we want especially students to have opportunities to explore culture and to become better learners of culture. And so giving them opportunities to do projects where they have to learn more about the other culture, ideally by interacting with native, with native speakers, can be very powerful. We want students to explore other disciplines. And I think for project-based language learning, this connection standard is one of the most critical um, for us to fo focus on. And I think it's one that tends to get slid under um, the rug a lot of times when we are working on um, language in language learning context. So we want students to explore science or art or music or social studies um, in order to acquire information that will help them complete the task we've asked them to do. And we certainly want them to make comparisons and to bring community into the classroom and to give them opportunities to go to use what they're learning to go out into communities and interact with them. So how do we craft a powerful driving question then? A powerful driving question has several characteristics. Number one, it's going to engage students with the world. Number two, it's going to give direction to the project. So if it's too, too vague, sometimes it's not very useful in really helping us to determine what's part of the project and what really doesn't belong as part of the project. So we want something that's going to frame and bound our exploration. We want the question to be open-ended. Uh, so questions that ask students yes or no that require sort of yes or no answers aren't generally very productive for project-based language learning because we want students to explore. So ideally, it's a question that we don't necessarily know the answer to. Um, we might have some ideas and some hypotheses, but we want students to be able to do exploring through the project. Um, so one really good rule of thumb is if they can't Google it to find it, um, in other words, it's a problem that's, or, or project that's rooted in multiple disciplines, so they can't just Google one thing to get the answer or find the answer in their textbook. We want the question to be something that evokes curiosity, that makes students want to talk about it. They can't wait to communicate about it because it's something that's so interesting to them. And so we want it to be something that motivates inquiry and action. Do students bubble with questions about it? Does it make them want to go explore things on their own? Do they rush to come tell you what they've learned about that particular thing? And those are nice um, questions for you to evaluate your existing projects. Are students bubbling with questions that don't just have to do with the particulars of the assignment, but questions about the content or the culture? Um, and we want our projects to invite students to do the things they have to do to move forward in their proficiency. So are they describing? Are they narrating? Are they hypothesizing as part of their projects? Most importantly, we want our, our questions to have a conceptual anchor. And one easy place to start with this is in our textbooks. So um, forgive the, the solely Spanish examples, but that's my background, so that's what I have. Um, we want students to start, for example, maybe with the vocabulary topics. And then I'm going to take those textbook topics and see how I can expand them into a driving question. And we do that by adding three pieces by shifting it from a topic to a conceptual issue, by connecting it to a social problem, and by grounding it in a cultural issue or context. Um, so as an example, maybe the textbook topic is clothing. Maybe my conceptual issue is fashion. My social issue might be personal identity. And my cultural issue might be the issue of cultural identity. 
So my driving question might look something along the, well, actually, I'll show you some of the examples of the questions for these in just a second. Body parts might be the topic. So the conceptual issue would be health care. The, the social problem related to that would be people's access to health care. And that can also be the cultural issue as well. If the topic is school, then maybe the conceptual issue is going to be education. The social issue we want to connect to is illiteracy. And the cultural issue is how illiteracy uh, connects to poverty. So here are some examples of narrow textbook topics, art, farm vocabulary, house vocabulary, the present conjunctive, the proper versus imperfect. And maybe a more broad topic that we might ground those in. How can art be used as social commentary, um, et cetera? Um, so these would be some examples of different guiding questions that came out of these narrow topics that we then made conceptual and social and uh, cultural connections to. How can various art forms of art function as social commentary? And then getting students to think about, well, what comments would I like to make about society? And how can I use my creative voice to transform society in positive ways? Uh, for advertising, how are, which came out of the idea of present subjunctive, how are advertising techniques influenced by culture? How does advertising influence me or society? In what ways does my life advertise certain values, beliefs, and principles? And are there ways that I can influence the media? So these are types of questions that you might think about. Now, for those of you who work with level one learners, um, Senora Spanglish has done a really nice job of coming up with some driving questions that you could use for project-based language learning. Um, and she's just brainstorming here. And so I think one of the really important things to keep in mind mm -hmm. is that it's very important to um, open yourself up and to be willing to entertain lots of different possibilities before you settle on a particular question. Um, here are some driving questions that some of my student teachers came up with. Um, what causes ordinary people to seem extraordinary in the eyes of others? And then this student had his students do a lot of explorations of people who were considered heroes in the target culture. In a unit on clothing, Madison Bell had her students explore how clothing reflects the values and practices of a culture and what their own styles, what students' own style says about who they are. So the idea that, um, for example, in Guatemala, the things that people wear signify something about where you're from, what kinds of things that you like or dislike, um, and you know, your, who, what you claim is your own personal identity. Um, and then finally, advertising we kind of already talked about briefly. So ideally, when we're crafting these driving questions, we want them to accomplish three things. We want them to get students to consider how they are connected to other disciplines and to whatever the issue is that we've selected or that they've selected with us. We want our questions to give students opportunities to explore other cultures and to make comparisons. And we want these questions to motivate students to take some kind of creative action, ideally. Um, and authenticity is at the heart of all of this. <coughs> Excuse me. I really love um, this piece where it says, knowledge comes in a way unsought, as in the Chinese tale of the youth who came for daily lessons in what there was to learn of Jade. And each day, for a single hour, while he and the master talked together, always of unrelated matters, jade pieces were slipped into his hand, until one day, when a month had passed, the young man paused and with a frown said suddenly, that is not jade. And I think this is the power of project-based language learning. It puts us in a position where we can um, help students to really explore and experiment and experience the language to the point where they do acquire it naturally in the process of accomplishing these things. And with that, I will open it, uh, the presentation up for questions. And here are the questions. Thank you, Charisse. Um, the first question is, uh, if you do projects like school policies or school-related issues, how do you incorporate the target culture? Uh, and how do you present a product in the target language <laughs> that a larger audience familiar with the school will understand? That's a great question. So 
and, and it kind of comes back to the standards. So one of the, the things about um, school policies might be that perhaps students are going to explore what is the school policy, for example, on school uniforms or things of that nature in other countries. And then based on those explorations, maybe they're going to craft an action plan or a list of ideas, and maybe they're going to explore multiple countries or multiple um, you know, contexts. Uh, does that answer your question, hopefully? Um, so, the, so I guess the idea is simply looking for connections. And this is where the integrated performance assessment can be really powerful, because students can explore culturally authentic texts and integrate um, you know, as they look at uh, interviewing native speakers, things of that nature, they can gather and acquire information about the topic. Then you can give them opportunities to interact and collaborate around those issues, to think about those, they can debate them, discuss them, whatever, in preparation for producing some sort of final project or performance, um, if that is the direction that the project takes you. Okay, great. Um, here is the next question. Um, uh, the participant says, I'm working to create an online high school course in advanced Chinese. While I can foresee a number of different PBL style projects for students to work on, my fear is that this work would primarily be of students working solo. Do you know of any precedent for students to work in groups online, particularly when they are taking part uh, from different schools? I realize that my question is pretty focused, but it would be great if you can point me to any sort of precedent in this kind of PBL work online. So the answer to your question is yes and no. Um, there are loads of examples of uh, schools from different countries and even different continents collaboratively working together using wikis, for example. Um, Unfortunately, project-based language learning tends to be or, or is still pretty new in the language learning field in some ways, particularly those kinds of, of um, hybrid, multi-discipline, you know, multi, uh, multiply complex projects. Um, Tony Tyson has done some interesting things with her students um, in interacting with students from other schools, and I can post, let me make a note of that right now, and I will post um, some examples of places that you can look at for that. The Flat Classroom Project is a great example of that kind of collaboration, although it is not specific to language learning. Um, and I do have several other examples that I can post for you. OK, uh, another question. Uh, how do you implement PBLL with beginning level students? students who are learning the basics, such as how to introduce themselves. You mentioned it's possible to use PBLL with low-level students. Can you elaborate more on that? Yes. So the first thing that I should say is that that is going to be the primary focus of some of the upcoming lessons, especially the, the segment on scaffolding. Um, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on that here other than to say, not only is it possible, I know it's possible because I've done it with my own students for a long time. Um, part of it has to do with increasing the cognitive complexity of what you're doing in the classroom while keeping the language that you're asking students to use in order to accomplish their communication at a level that's developmentally appropriate for the students that you are working with. And so, as I mentioned, in future modules, we'll be talking about what that looks like, and I'll try to have some really concrete examples for you of that. Any other questions? One final question. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, can you give examples of the products or projects that would follow the specific driving questions you included in your presentation toward the end? Ooh, that one's kind of hard because I'm not sure. Oh, the specific um, driving questions, yes. So, for example, the question on um, health care, uh, students did a lot of um, exploration of what were some of the common diseases and issues in that particular country, like malaria, 
uh, you know, sting, fever, things of that nature. And then they um, put together materials like posters and things for their, uh, the students put together posters and things in Spanish um, that were designed to teach people about those issues. So for example, what is the, you know, what are some of the causes of malaria? What can you do to prevent against getting malaria? What are some simple things? Um, the language worked really well for those beginning students because the, the literacy level of the people in the target culture who would be reading these materials was very low. So my students had to use very simple language because that's all they knew, or not my students, but my student teacher's students. And the students that they were communicating with um, could only read those basic things. So that would be one example. In terms of the um, advertising project, very similar to what you might expect in a regular language learning classroom where they're working on a unit about you know, giving commands. Um, except that the idea is that students are having to investigate and explore a target audience of people from the target culture uh, in order to sell some particular project or idea or product. Um, in this particular case, they made public service announcements around various social issues which they had found out were issues in that country by doing investigation. Mm -hmm.